Radio Free America. This is Uncle Sam with music and the truth until dawn. Right now, I've got a few words for some of our brothers and sisters in the occupied zone. The chair is against the wall. The chair is against the wall. John has a long mustache. John has a long mustache. It's 12 o'clock, Americans, another day closer to victory. And for all of you out there on or behind the line, this is your song. <laughs> Hey, welcome everybody to our daily gun show. We come to you live every night at midnight Eastern. We talk about guns for an hour. Got a couple of people joining us. We got a dog body jumping in from Nevada. Thanks for joining. Well, thanks for having me. You bet. We got a Gizzard jumping in from Kansas. Thanks for the right. invite. And Snob jumping in from almost Kansas, but really Oklahoma. Thank you for joining. Yep, thanks for the invite. I didn't get to be here in a while. Excited to be back. Yeah, it's good to have uh, people that are jumping on, and we're watching the Gun Channel side. There's uh, a bunch of people over there. Thanks for watching on Gun Channels. I see Cycles out there. We'll send him a link. I am not see them in here. Do you guys get them in your buddy list? You run in. Oh, it's not showing up. Guess a narrow brand, narrow cast in here, but uh, anyway, we're also broadcasting on gun, uh, I guess, on YouTube. So, uh, throwing some links out over there. Um, today we're talking, kind of talking to the same time. There, Cycle has a link now. Uh, we're talking rust removal. So, I don't know if you guys have ever dealt with that. Uh, and then we're going to talk about the coolest gun. So, right now, the shows are getting kind of cycled. Like you said, I don't get to do the show every night. Um, sometimes I'm just exhausted, and other times I'm in the middle of driving and stuff. So it uh, hasn't been great, but uh, kind of recycling the shows so they're all shuffled around out of order. So this is probably, uh, well, I guess it is a Friday show, so that worked out. But um, anyway, uh, well, we want to start with rust removal. Yeah, I'm good with that. Sure. Yeah. Yep. Do you want one else to start? Yeah, I'm untangling a dog. She's all twisted up in her leaf. So oh, that's what I thought. Yeah, light light surface rust. I'm I'm still doing the old uh, steel wool and uh, gun oil. Thing. occasionally i'll actually start with like liquid wrench or a penetrating oil to make sure i'm getting down under it if it's if it's serious rust then i then i do soak it in uh in a penetrating oil first to start to try to get underneath it yeah I'll, 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 I'll go ahead i'll say I, I keep a handful of old pennies for taking care of light rust removal and stuff in certain guns they work real well for just scraping it off and getting it out. I've used the CLP and like the quadruple odd or whatever steel wool a lot. And then if it's real bad, just sandblast it and Cerakote. It's my other go-to. I do like, I do like Yankee's comment about using, I guess there's like an artificial steel wool that's actually more like a pad and you don't get the steel wool splinters in your fingers. And I, I'm definitely going to try buying some of that stuff because some of the old mill serps I have, I get done working on because I'm an idiot and I don't wear gloves. And and when I get done working on one of those, my fingers look like little porcupines. Yeah, and you can use those gray, the gray scotch bright pads won't scratch really. Like the yeah. red will take the finish sometimes, but the gray won't usually. And I've also used, uh, there used to be a brass, um, a thing you used to wash dishes that was like brass in a coil. Yep, I know what you're talking about. And those work they good too it. because they won't scratch the, the gun. Yeah, the, you can usually find those wherever they keep cast iron in your local store. So yes. They're great. For, yeah. Huh. That's a good idea. And I'm a big believer in the soak. You know, I mean, you saw what happened with those, uh, the guns I had that were had rusted, uh, the insides of the barrels were fouled so bad. And I actually filled them with, uh, with the remover, uh, taped the ends closed and set them upside down in a garbage can for two days. And the stuff that came out of there was like really gross. 
Well, I've got a question for some of you all. Maybe some of you all know. I mean, I came from, you know, I've worked on cars a lot and worked in body shops and stuff, but what would navel jelly do? Does that take the bluing off too? I just don't know. I have no, never tried it. Been scared oh, yeah. to. Navel jelly will rip the bluing right off. That's what I figured. I've just never tried it. <laughs> and my, my brother-in-law, he recently, he recently bought a pistol and it was, it was really kind of cruddy. So he put it in one of those vibratory cleaners on one of those ultrasonic jobs and he made the mistake of putting simple green in there with it and it ripped the fluing right off the gun. I couldn't believe it. Really? See, the I gun came out in the white. I use simple green all the time to degrease for seracoding. That's what I soak it in. And I've got where I just, if I'm cleaning a gun, it's real dirty. I just tear it all the way down and just throw it in a simple green, let it soak for 30. But I'm not using an ultrasonic. But you're not using ultrasonic, right? Yeah, I'm just using it just in a tank. See, I, I like to use the simple green to clean it. Whenever we're talking about just like deep cleaning AR bolts and stuff like that, it works great for getting it back to just steel. But I think that the uh, I mean, taking all the bluing off, that might not be a bad way to go for you if you look into re-blue because maybe the original job was so far gone anyway. So it's not yeah. necessarily always a bad thing. If, if you're looking at something where you're trying to maintain the patina, then you, you don't want to do that. But if you've just got an older gun and you just need to really get the rust out of it, I'm a big firm believer. If you have to go after that thing with a wire brush on a wheel, do it and get, get that rust out of there and then re-blew it. Yeah. If you're not, if it's not a collector gun or worth any, you know, worth money like that or that, I always just sandblast it and Cerakote it. So, cause I'm a big fan of that and do that. So seems to be a pretty easy way. No, I wonder if you send, don't, don't they have like walnut hull crushed up powder that they use for that sometimes? Well, I use, yeah, but I used a uh, hundred grit garnet red sand. It's just a real fine sand. Yeah. The garnets are pretty hard, but they're not harder than iron. I don't think on the most scale of hardness. I'd no. have to go look it up. But they don't, they don't actually etch into the <coughs> steel much. You shoot at a low pressure and like 80 or 100 pounds uh -huh. and blast it at that. And it doesn't really etch the steel, but just removes it. Well, I'm kind of curious. Uh, I've seen guys do it for restoring old swords and knives. Has anybody ever done like the car battery electrolysis? I don't know. Usually that's how you plate stuff, isn't it? And then how did that usually go the other way? I suppose you could reverse it and try to draw stuff out, I've but, I, guys, but I, I wouldn't think the oxide would come off first. That's my only concern. Well, I've seen them use it, uh, vinegar baths with electrolysis to cause the rust to break off of old swords, and knives and stuff. <laughs> So I, I don't know. That's why I was kind of curious if anybody ever did that with a gun. Vinegar is another thing that'll remove rust. I don't know what it'll do to bluing. Never tried it, but yeah, it's really good on a coffee maker too. I use white vinegar on my coffee maker every couple months. It's really good with cucumbers and onions too. But just yeah. saying. <laughs> <laughs> not after you run it through the coffee maker, it's not. No. <laughs> well, and and let's face it, that's how they that's how they do ships hulls, right? They they put that that different metal and they weld chunks of that to the hull and it's like a it's a it's a sacrificial yeah. thing and the the rust eats that stuff first i don't, I don't know how it figures it out but yeah sacrificial anodes is what you're talking yeah. about i'm not 100 yeah. percent. i'm i think i saw an episode of deadliest catch where they talked about that once wow <laughs> but it's one of the it goes yeah, I saw it on a thing about cruise ships because you know me and the cruise ships, we get along real good. So, but yeah, it's uh, generally generally speaking, though, the big thing with rust, and and the other thing with rust is, you know, there's two solutions to rust: elbow grease and time. So if you've if you've got the if you need to get it done quick, the elbow grease will do it. But if you have the time and you have a place where you can soak it. I, I personally think soaking does, you know, if you if you can take the time to soak it, you'll get a better result. All right. Another question kind of on this. How are you all, like, I know, Cycle, you have a lot of collectible guns and stuff. How do you store them in your safe? What do you oil them with before you store them for extended periods of time? Uh, ballastol. I use ballastol. It smells awful. Oh, and yeah. Those, I, I hate And when the gun stops stinking, you know, it's time to re-oil it. It's, time to re -oil it. it's <laughs> like automatic. It's great. 
Ballast yeah, tells about the ballast MSCL ballast BIU. Very, it, it's it's environmentally good, and it's real. It's very sticky. But I was always taught as a kid to never handle a gun by anything but the wood. So when I like when I put a gun back in a safe, I don't grab it by the barrel and put it in a safe. And and that seems to have helped quite a bit. The the only times I ever get in trouble are uh, internal parts if I don't do a god good job you know, keeping the gun clean when I'm putting it back together. And I have a couple of shotguns where the bolts are in the white and I don't give a shit what you do to those. They are going to turn brown in the safe because I live in the Northeast and there's nothing I can do. I, I'm not going to spend it. Well, I shouldn't say there's nothing I can do. I'm not going to spend the money for like he, the, the golden rods or any of that other junk, you know, to keep the saves you know, at a, at a higher temperature and drive the water out. But you know, a lot of people do that, but that that's a that's an after the fact well, i mean know, i look at it this way most of those guns were laying around in gun shops and in people's closets for 40 years before i got a hold of them so mm -hmm. they're, they're so far ahead of the game with me giving a little loving care not, not going to be a problem well I, i'll tell you something really cheap that i like to do for some of the times it's safe is a couple broken pieces of drywall at the bottom of it they suck up the moisture in the air to help keep it dry. Uh, I always got extra drywall around. Well, yeah, but I'm always afraid that Chinese drywall is going to make my gun sick. <laughs> <laughs> uh, question. Now, this is interesting because you, you mentioned wood, and I've always been, if I'm putting a rifle up for a long time, not only do I make sure that you know all the metal components are oiled, but I like to put a little linseed oil um, all the wood before I put it up. Anybody well, that's else? advantage of ballast all because you can use it on wood and metal. I do do a whole freaking gun. You know, it's funny you're talking about that. I need to go get my grandpa's got you know his old guns. He's ninety two, and he's just got a few old guns. He's got an old sixteen gauge single shot and a little uh, Montgomery Ward or Sears and Roebuck twenty two, but it's a Marlin Model sixty is what it is. But anyways, it's so bad. I was trying to shoot that shotgun here while back at buzzard and uh the thing wouldn't even eject the shells and i came down here and just sprayed it with some ballastol he's like yeah i need to put some saddle oil on it it's getting a little rusty and that's all he's ever used that ever since he's had these guns is saddle oil i don't know how good that is for him but yeah steadily out there on youtube is talking about clp2 and i'll tell you i i run into a lot of guys who love that stuff but you know Gun oils are like car oils. You know, you become some kind of religious fanatic about your particular gun oil. Now, just because I use, when I'm long storing a gun, I use ballastol, but during the season, I just use REM oil or whatever gun oil. If they have a yellow tag on it that says, hi, I'm on sale, that's basically the one I use. Yeah, ballastol is not real cheap. Well, it is. it is if you buy it in the big jugs. But you got to be careful not to contaminate it. Yeah, I bought, I don't know how many cans of the little, I don't know, whatever they are, <clears throat> eight or 10 ounce aerosol cans at NRA annual meeting last year because they were like, I don't remember, eight bucks or something a can, which was like half price over what Cabela's has it for. So I bought like 10 cans, I think. Yeah. And I've been. Clay, Clay says 50% humidity helps. And I, yeah, that, too bad. I'm I in the North. I don't know what 50% humidity is. <laughs> yeah. I don't even get 50% humidity when I'm running the air conditioner in the bedroom. But yeah, I, you know, I, and I'm bad, I'm bad that way with lubricants. You know, I mean, there's some, there's some that I don't really get I like hoppies. I like hoppies. I actually love the way hoppy smells, man. That's, it's great. I wish they made a cologne like that, <laughs> but, uh, but you know, like I said, for the longer term, I have had, just better personal experience with ballastol. If you can stand a stink, this stuff works really good. It does smell bad though. Yeah. I don't even know how to describe how it smells. But but seal the break free, uh th there's a well, oh, there's two of them. One of them is like a there's a gun scrubber uh, uh, uh birchwood casey, that's what I'm trying to think of. For cleaning birchwood casey, I love that shit. That's good stuff. Like their boar scrubber or whatever, that stuff. Well, and they have the one that's, and, and I think Midnight's talking about it too. 
is they have the, the stuff that comes out like a foam and you actually get like a big plastic tube with it. That's what I used on those guns that I turned upside down because that stuff, it, when you, when you put it in the barrel, it doesn't just run out because it fo has that foaming action. Mm -hmm. And that shit is for, if you want something to put on a gun where you can just leave it and you know, it's going to stay in there and work and not like, that's the problem with REM oil, you know, REM oil, it, it you know, it's going to come off and it's going to run out the end of the barrel and it's going to be all over. But this other stuff, oh man, it's incredible. And then, I mean, going back to where Almost we started, hotel, wow. going back to where we started with rust. I mean, that's, I, I've made a, a, not a lot of money, but I've made a little bit of money over the years, just collecting rusty shotguns and cleaning them up from pawn shops and stuff because people don't want to put in the elbow work. And you'd be amazed at the deals you can get with some of that stuff just because it has a little rust on it. Oh Yeah. And that's one thing I do all the time, just try to buy cheap guns that are, well, I just bought a uh, Savage little semi-automatic 22 the other day. I bought it and a shotgun for 150 bucks for both, and it was a Maverick 88 shotgun. Neither one of them worth a lot, but the, the 22 they just threw in basically for free, and it uh, all the bluing was gone off the barrel, and I was like, mm, I'll Cerakote that, and you know, got it for nothing, so. Well, yeah, I've picked up lots of, you know, Savage or Stover shotguns over the years that were all rusted up bring them home, clean them up, take them back, sell them for usually more than you paid for them or to somebody, you know, just because you can clean them up a little. Yeah. And, and I, I will admit <clears throat> that if I don't care about the finish that much, I have been known to use a bath of brake cleaner. Well, so that's something else I use a lot, you know, coating, but Again, you're not worried about yeah, the you want to you want to get the oil finish. and shit off a gun, man. There's nothing that'll rip that stuff oh, off yeah. there, and yeah. and rust as well, like brake cleaner that that stuff. But you you have to not really be worried. Like if you've got a gun that's got an enameled finish, a painted finish, you don't even want to come near it with that stuff. No, and the only thing I use it on stuff that's getting refinished anyway, so I'm not concerned at all. But you know, I worked in a body shop for years when I was when I grew up basically in a body shop and stuff, and uh, it, I really think brake clean is nothing but lacquer thinner. It smells just like lacquer thinner, works basically just like lacquer thinner in an aerosol can. I've swore to that for years. You might very well be right, sir. Yeah. So that's a whole bunch about rust. Why don't we dig into coolest gun you bought? Oh, man, that's a hard one. So I'll give you a minute to think about it, and we'll talk about our member of the day. So you notice I already posted the links to uh, MW Tactical, so it's m-wtactical.com. And that's Mike, who's been a uh, guest host on, uh, well, Black Man with a Gun for, for that podcast for quite a while, but also on Clover and Ghost Chats more recently over on Gun Channels. And uh, Mike's just... You know, kicking it on many fronts, and he's a cool dude, and uh, another asset to gun channels. Yeah, I really like to... Sorry, I interrupted you there. Yeah, he's a good dude. Oh, yeah, I've been on several chats with him, and he's just a super guy. Wouldn't meet, can't meet anybody nicer than him either. So I'll like say through his links out there. I'll throw them out again, and we'll talk about oops, we'll talk about uh, coolest gun you buy. That's that's really hard. You know, I, I have three. Okay, so um, the uh, the nineteen thirty five A, the French pistol that I bought uh, last year was really cool because the person who sold it to me and neither did I did not know what they had. And with all those Nazi marks and stuff on it, and it had all, you know, it, 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 it was, it was all parts matching. It had the, it had the correct magazine and it had the Waffen stomp on it and the Eagle with the, with the swastika on the barrel. And it was just, it just ended up being an amazing gun. It don't shoot worth the damn, even though it fits great. It's got the hardest trigger pull of any freaking semi-automatic I ever pulled in my life. But just from a, just a sheer 
provenance and you know it was made during wartime and and all that stuff it just ended up being a really cool gun so that was really cool but then the other really cool gun was i actually found not exactly the same gun but i found the gun that my dad gave me when i was a little boy the the the, the bolt action single shot that i had now, as a little boy like, you don't and, mean like found in the basement no i mean i found a i found that a model of that gun in really horrible shape at a gun store and got them to sell it to me for 50 bucks. And then I went and went after it and cleaned it all up and stripped the stock back down and refinished it properly and ended up with the gun that I had as a little boy. And so that was just cool from the, you know, it just had a lot of, uh, uh, what do you call it? A lot of, uh, uh, personal, you know, coolness to it. You know, it was just really good. And then the, yeah. the coolest gun I have in my military collection has got to be that French 4956. I mean, that, that thing is just awesome. The one that I brought down to Tulsa that everybody got a chance to shoot. So those are my three coolest guns and it for three different reasons. One, because it was so unexpectedly neat. One, because it was, you know, something from my childhood. And the other one, because it was just the, it's probably the coolest battle rifle I own of all the, of all the different battle rifles I own from different countries. That is absolutely the coolest battle rifle I own. Who's saying? Uh, your coolest gun. Who's next? I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and throw my hat in on this. So I'm going to narrow it down to two, both of which are handguns. Uh, one of them is a gun that I I wanted before they even made it because I've been dreaming about having one since I was a kid. And that's the Rock Island M19 uh, A2. I always wanted, when I was a kid, I, I wanted a Delta Elite 10 millimeter. Never got one. And then uh, when I saw Rock Island made a double stack in 10 millimeter, I knew I had to have it. So there's that one that is just kind of like a gun I had always been hoping they'd make since I was a kid. And I finally got one as an adult. And then the other one, which is a gun that I absolutely hate, but it has a lot of sentimental value to me uh, because it was the first gun my wife ever asked me for. And that is a little Glock 42. And it just, uh, you know, it's not a very impressive gun. I personally hate the gun, but it's a cool gun to me because it was the first gun my wife ever picked up and said that she actually wanted. And that made me really happy. So it's cool for that reason. That's pretty cool. <clears throat> Gary, you're next. All right. Well, I got a couple. Uh, first one would probably be the 1911 I bought. Although I, I have a kind of a personal thing for all my guns, so it's kind of hard for me to pick a favorite or anything like that. But the 1911 I'd been looking at buying for two or three years and never could find one around here exactly like I wanted. And I stumbled across one in this old store around here that was about to be closed. He only had two or three guns left, and I'll be darned if he didn't have one sitting in there. And uh, $419. And so I went ahead and bought oh, that. Oh, cheap. Yeah, that's my baby. Oh, man. And then I went in. This is about the same year I went in looking for a twenty two just to target practice with, something that'd be a great range gun with a 22 and my guy at the local gun store he says well i got something older if you don't mind it and i said what's that he said i got an old high standard back here he said it might look like heck he said you clean that thing up and shoot it he said it'll be a great range gun so i did just what he said i took it took it all apart learned how to take it down clean it up took that thing to the range and man it's a tack driver and then I looked it up, the serial number, just to see how old it was. And it's a year older than I am. So it's kind of my buddy. Oh, so wow. Kind of that got a little bit of sentimental guy. value for that one, too. <clears throat> so it's not a flintlock, huh? 
<laughs> Max <laughs> Fuck. That was fine. Uh, oh, that's great. Mine would be when I was a kid, and I didn't actually buy it. My dad bought it, and I had it for a long time. He gave it to me, and then I don't know whatever happened to it. But it was a little three barreled cap and ball pistol. And I think it was 30 caliber, 32 caliber, or something. I don't even remember. It's been so long. But it fired all three barrels at once, and it was like a gambler's gun underneath the table. And I thought that was just the coolest thing. And I wish I still had it to this day, but I don't have any clue whatever happened to it. Like a little pepper box. Yeah. It was neat as could be, but it had three barrels and they were, I don't know, 15 degrees, 20 degrees apart. And they shot all three at the same time. Had one hammer and one cap. Oh, kind of like a duck foot. Okay. Yeah. And then a gun that I had as a kid, uh, Psycho Camp reminded me of that. And I have been looking on Gun Broker all the time for one just like it. And I haven't found one exactly like it. Was the little, I had a Daisy 22 bolt action. And it used a little magazine like a Ruger 1022, a rotary mag, 10 round rotary mag. But mine had wood stocks and an octagon barrel. I can find them with an octagon barrel and I can find them with wood stocks, but I can't find them together with that. So many of them have plastic stocks or the round. Well, buy, buy two guns. I guess I could. And then put them together. I mean, it's not they like know. they're expensive. They're cheap when you see them. They're like 70, 80 bucks. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, put, put them think. both together. And then take the one with the plastic stock and sell it, and and there you go, you're you're there. Yeah. That's a good point. It was just a you know that gun. I couldn't tell you how many rounds of twenty two I shot. Everything that moved with it when I was a little kid, you know, and everything that didn't move also. But carried that thing around. It was beat all to heck, and then it just. I think it got stolen one time from my dad's house when it got broke into when I was a kid. Well, I lied because I never sell any guns. So don't don't buy both of them and then just put one in the corner and you know give it away uh -huh. or something. But don't sell it. I never sell any guns. I've made the mistake of selling a few. It won't ever happen again. All the the that that'll be a good topic for another day. The name the gun you regret getting rid of. Yeah, yeah. I, I got a couple of those. I can start naming a list when we get well, to that. Well, I'm just saying, let you know, let G use it for a future <laughs> show. But, but uh, that would be a that would be a good that would be a good one. Who haven't we heard from? I think we've actually talked about that before, but yeah, it's been a while. <clears throat> well, I try to only buy guns, at least for a while there. So I got a bunch, I would think. But uh, of all the ones I like the most, I think is probably my little 22 short from Rocky Mountain. So when Kasul invented that gun. That was the first one and they're out there but they're not there's there was never a lot of them and the people that have them just don't necessarily appreciate them so they haven't all survived so those are pretty that was a pretty neat one to find because of its uh the beginning of all the little modern mini revolvers uh yeah. but uh, I don't know, that or maybe my open bolt mac 380 really really like that gun awesome. well uh have to bring that out to a shoot sometime. Yeah, so, you have to bring that out to Tulsa. Yeah. Next time we all go out to Tulsa. Yeah, so everybody can fully appreciate open bolt goodness. Open yeah. Bolt and we, we we just won't tell them the caliber. That's all. We'll just be quiet about that. 380 is the shit. It's a brownie caliber. An awesome caliber. Oh, that's true. All right. So, um, that's a bunch of stuff that we talked about today and we'll probably do some other things. We can talk about a gun shop. Um, I'm going to talk about the shop in Utah. So I'm driving between Salt Lake city and St. George. So St. George is the little town in Utah. So I think it's a little town in Utah near uh, Vegas, it's the closest thing to Vegas. So there's a pretty big stretch there of just desert in Utah where you kind of drive tens or dozens of miles between mountain ridges into the basins. And at the bottom of one of them basins, there's a town called Beaver, Utah. And uh, somewhere between Salt Lake City and Beaver, there's a big billboard on the side of the road that says gun shop. And hundreds of guns or something I forgot because it was basically I'm passing a truck and then I seen the billboard so I don't know if I got it on my dash cam or not but I saw the billboard and uh, couldn't see the exit so 
got off in Beaver and found the basically the there's two gun shops there, three maybe. Uh, but I figured it was the big one, and uh, they have a big revolver on the front of the shop, like an old uh, somebody mute. Whoever's doing that, and uh, um, so mute if you're not talking, basically. So uh, they've got the old revolver out front, uh, hanging perpendicular off the front of the building, which is kind of cool. And uh, just a massive shop. And we talked about it a little bit yesterday, I think. Who's breathing into their mic? Mute. Oh, that's probably me. But, sorry. Anyway, so that was a cool shop. Unexpected, but I really like the idea of seeing a billboard out there. Uh, I don't know why more shops don't do it, I suppose, because of cost. But... Uh, you figure a bunch of people are driving between Vegas and Salt Lake City uh, to go skiing or to go gambling or back and forth. And they're all seeing that gun shop billboard, which is cool. And it's the large shop, so it's a, it's an outfitter. So I imagine if you're going to some lake out there, uh, you could stock up or grab anything you forgot or that you broke or lost, I guess. And uh, yeah, it's just neat to see a shop like that. Very old. Real friendly people. I think we might have talked about him yesterday. I remember talking about it maybe in one of the other shows. Well, it's called Beaver Sport and Pond. And I think I asked yesterday if anybody had been, had been there. Maybe we did talk about this one yesterday. No, I watched yesterday's show, and I don't remember it being on there. Okay. Well, I know I just posted it on Instagram, so that's why it was on top of my head. Um... Anything else we want to talk about tonight? Mm -hmm. Right on. So there any it's in front of me. I have my spreadsheet open on the, when I'm on the road. So Sean on the gun channel side is saying sounds corny, but they are sentimental to me. My great uncle was an armed guard and a long time working on his master's. He carried an old arms corps 38 snubby. My great grandfather's 1900 Savage 32. I never knew him. It's my connection to him. Yeah, that's what guns are all about. And that's one of the things that drives me nuts when anti Zol uh, dismiss. Um, the number of guns as if everybody has, you know, dozens of AR-15s when a lot of these guns, was this in a live chat or was this somebody I was talking to in real life? But somebody brought up a great point that guns have existed for a long time and they remain exist. You know, they, so as people inherit and people hand down uh, firearms for families, they start to accumulate. So people are, Oh, dozens of firearms potentially. Uh, we used to talk about it more in the end of uh, 2013 when the uh, one of the 23 in executive orders was something about being an arsenal owner. If you owned more than 50 guns, we would talk about you know if someone is married, they could potentially inherit the firearms from their own parents and their wives' parents, and now that family is going to own four you know inheritances worth of firearm collections that could easily add up to 50 and it's how neat is that that there's families out there that have you know these, these firearms collections that are growing in all those ways so uh yeah that's that's neat that you know you've got a couple of guns from uh your, uh, well and, and if you think on, about right. it there are guns here in america that are older than the oldest buildings in america Heck yeah you know, you got guns that came over from Europe, and, and they're older than anything. It was, it's older than the United States. It's older than the colonies, for God's sake. Some of those, some of those really old European rifles and European handguns and stuff. I mean, we're we're talking some serious history here, and and the history of the firearm is the history of the nation. That's one of the cool things about collecting firearms from different countries, is. It, firearms are always that funny, you know, it has to do with economics and what kind of trouble you're having with your neighbor and as well as what kind of really inventive people that you have. And truly the, 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 
the the firearms of a country tell the the story of that country's history when you get right down to it. Well, if you think about it, what other thing in this world do you buy? You know, if you buy a good quality gun, you can hand it down for generations upon generations. What other thing can you do that with, really? Well, you, you guys are completely right. I mean, a watch. Maybe. I don't guess I've ever bought a good watch. Well, back in the day, our grandparents would have. Well, yeah, you know, true. pocket watches and stuff. Yeah, back when there wasn't, you know, digital. But digital just kind of killed it. So you're right, guns persevere through that because they haven't come up with a ray gun yet. Well, I think that uh, I, when I was younger and I was traveling around, I heard this expressed by an old soldier. Uh, and I thought this was always the most poignant way to look at a gun. The gun is simply the new sword. If you go back in history, you know, it was always a big deal to inherit a, a relative's sword. That was a very big deal, especially in the male side of the culture. Because that was, meant you were, you know, it was symbolic of being responsible and head of the family kind of thing. And all the, all the gun is is just a reformed sword. Okay, that's what they've become, culturally and society-wise speaking. Didn't mean to kill the chat there. No, I like that analogy. Yeah, that worked pretty good. But but for some reason, you don't see people inheriting in their family sword collections. Well, they are. They're just inheriting them in the form of guns now. Yeah. No, you know, I'm just I'm just saying that the, the firearm is kind of unique in that in that. Uh, People have such an appreciation for the mechanics. I mean, I'm sure like in Japan, I'm sure there are people that own swords from their ancestors that are highly revered because that that it was more a part of their culture. You know what I mean? In the United States, the firearm it really usurps that position and, and becomes that that part of our culture. Well, that's my point. Campus. If you go back 500 years in human history, <clears throat> sword was a big deal across all people who had mastered metal. We just got to the point where our metal stopped being swords and became guns. Yep. Yeah, that makes sense. Yep. But there, that is one downfall to like new firearms, you know, per se polymer guns and stuff like that. You get, there's, you know, probably not going to get handed down in last generations like good. No, you know, one of guns did. No, yeah, in 2200, I wonder how many you know, 2000 era Glocks are going to be that are still actually functional. Oh, that's as long, scary, as, man. as long as nobody left them out in the sun and the, and the polymer didn't decay or, you know, <laughs> that kind of stuff. Well, they don't need to be of high quality or longevity to be significant. The little guns that your grandma might've had or your grandpa might've had to take his loot to the bank every weekend or something. You know, don't need to be high quality to be significant for your family history. Uh, you know, I've got a couple of guns that I inherited from my grandpa on my mom's side. And it's, you know, one of them's a Marlin 22 mag bolt action. And the other one's a Remington 1148. And I'll never get rid of either one of those guns just because of, you know, where they came from. But nothing special. But still shoot them both all the time, though. Yeah, and my all... ex-wife's dad had a had a little thirty-eight or thirty-two, I think, a little thirty-two that he had, and it was like tucked up in the rafters of the of the house. And I, oh man, I always lusted after that gun. Was, I, don't, I don't even know what kind it was. It was probably an H and K, but uh, but you know, it, was, it was probably a break top H and K. But but uh, that was just one of those things that uh, I'm really sorry that that got away. But every one of those guns is being listed as a gun. And when the antis look at that, they think, again, a bunch of AR-15s and stuff with stocks on it. Mm -hmm. Pistol grips and everything. So maybe uh, take something from this show and do something on your own with uh, maybe Patriot's uh, project and describe an old gun or an interesting gun that you got or a family gun or something like that. Um, 
don't know what else. Uh, there's probably some history stuff we're missing, like you said, but uh, I guess we'll start wrapping it up. Uh, thanks, everybody, for jumping in and being part of the show, especially the people over on the Gun Channel side. And uh, we'll be pushing these over to GunStreamer at some point. Uh, it's a pretty cool platform for watching gun related videos. They're uh, actual people that we've been in contact with. And uh, I suggest putting your efforts, uh, your viewing habits and stuff with people that are actually in the game. Yeah, Ash was in the chat just a minute ago. Exactly. Like, you know, nobody from YouTube is. And if they are, it's to tag us or flag us or demonetize or persecute. So thanks, everybody, for being part of it.